This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Axis and Allies Pacific. Avalon Hill released Axis and Allies Pacific in 2001. Rob Davio and Stephen Baker designed this version along with Larry Harris Jr. based on his core Axis and Allies design. Axis and Allies Pacific supports from 2 to 3 players and takes about 4 hours to play. To begin, let's set up the general gameplay area. We'll start by placing the game board. Each player should also have a small personal space near the board to organize their game components. The player assuming the role of Japan should sit in front of the game board. The player or players taking on the role of the allied countries should sit behind the game board. Let's place the national setup charts to mark these spots. Besides setup instructions, these playmats also provide useful reference information for playing the game. We'll talk more about the national setup chart in just a moment. The player should also collect their national control markers as well as their plastic miniatures. The color choices for this particular entry in the series can be a little confusing even for veteran players. In this game, Japanese miniatures are colored red. India and Australia use the tan figures, and the United States has green figures, but be on the lookout for two shades of green for the infantry unit. The lighter shade indicates a U.S. Marine. The green that matches the rest of the U.S. units is a regular infantry unit. Finally, China is represented by a brown figure. The U.S. also has two types of fighter planes, the P-38 Lightning and the Navy Hellcat. There is no difference in gameplay between these figures. The designers just decided to provide these different types because it would be cool, I guess. To the right of the game board, place the battle board and six dice on each side. Each type of plastic miniature has an attack and defense rating. Rolling at or below these numbers allows the player to score a hit on their enemy. Depending on their position in the battle, each player places their miniatures on either the attacker or defender side of the battle board, which has a specific space for each miniature along with its rating. To the left of the game board, place the national production chart. Beneath this chart, organize a bank with stacks of the game's money called industrial production certificates, or IPCs. Also, prepare stacks of colored chips and the numbered task force marker and task force cards within reach of each side. Now that the gameplay area is ready, let's move in closer to discuss setting up the game board and the national production chart. The game board depicts the Pacific Theater, December 7, 1941. The game board map is divided into spaces representing territories and sea zones. At the beginning of the game, five major national powers control territories on the board. India, part of the United Kingdom, and an allied power controls the dark green territories. Australia, also part of the United Kingdom, controls light green and purple territories. The purple territories represent the Dutch East Indies, but they're under Australia's control at the beginning of the game. The United States, the second allied power in the game, controls all blue territories. China, who is allied with the United States, controls the sand-colored territories. Finally, Japan, the sole Axis power in the game, controls all brown territories. Japan has been in conflict with China prior to the start of this game. You'll notice three brown territories in the north of China that have a faded Chinese national emblem. These territories belonged to China but were conquered by Japan prior to the opening of this game. Many spaces on the game board contain numbers. These numbers represent a territory's industrial production. Each turn, a territory will award its owner with that number in industrial production certificates or IPCs. The collective territories under a nation's control makes up their economy. A nation uses their IPCs to purchase military units to defend their territories and expand their influence to other territories to support their side of the war. In this version of Axis and Allies, the Allied nation's economy is also supported by convoy centers. 
Convoy centers represent a nation's commercial shipping interests heading into the Pacific from around the world. The U.S. has two convoy centers that add to their industrial production total. The United Kingdom has three British convoy centers marked with the Union Jack. When setting up the game, the United Kingdom player, or players if tackling this game with three players, must decide whether India or Australia will benefit from these British convoy centers industrial production. These British convoy centers must all be assigned to either India or Australia. They cannot be divided up. Once this decision is made, let's now turn our attention to the next critical board in the game. This is the National Production Chart. The National Production Chart has three different tracks. A track for national productions from territories and convoy centers, a victory point track for Japan, and a Japanese kamikaze attack track. First, let's take a look at national production. The numbered spaces on the national production chart section can be a little confusing. These numbered spaces trace the following path. Now that you're orientated to the flow, let's continue. The flag icons printed on the chart indicate that nation's starting industrial production, which translates into the number of IPCs, in other words money, they receive each turn. These numbers will fluctuate constantly throughout the game as territories are gained and lost. Therefore, each player places a flag roundel, called a national control marker, to track the change. You'll also notice that there is a space with the Union Jack. This is to track the three British convoy centers. Whichever nation the United Kingdom decided would benefit from the convoy centers collects the amount of IPCs tracked by this marker. Whenever territories are lost and gained amongst players, reduce the appropriate amount of industrial production from the previous owner and add it to the new owner of the territory. Now, managing a nation's economy with the loss and gain of territories and convoy centers is pretty straightforward. However, the designers took it a step further with the concept of convoy zones. So let's head back to the map and I'll show you what I mean. This game's map is composed mostly of islands and the designers wanted to give this version of Axis and Allies a strong naval emphasis. To accomplish this, they integrated the concept of convoys and ship blockades to the game. We just discussed convoy centers that represents a nation's commercial interests coming onto the game board. Convoy zones continue this line of thought with smaller islands that have industrial production points. For example, the Philippines have an industrial production value of 3. The Americans control the Philippines at the beginning of the game. Like most islands, it requires commerce with the outside world to maintain its industry. Therefore, the sea around the Philippines is a convoy zone for the American player. Now, if the Japanese take control of the sea around the Philippines, but not the island itself, they've successfully blockaded the country. Without control of its convoy zone, the Philippines is disconnected from, from the U.S. economy. As a result, the U.S. player loses three industrial production points due to the Japanese blockade. However, the Japanese do not control the island yet where the actual production facilities exist. Therefore, the Japanese player cannot collect the three industrial points until they take the island. Or the U.S. player clears the blockade and regains the Philippines, and as a result, regains its three industrial points. As you can see, convoy zones add a new layer of strategy to this version of Axis and Allies. However, all players need to be vigilant when managing the industrial production chart to ensure accuracy with each nation's industrial production totals. Now that we have a basic understanding of this section of the chart, each nation should collect their starting industrial production certificates. Collect IPCs equal to that nation's starting position on this chart. Remember, either India or Australia will also collect the income for the position of the Union Jack convoy marker. Now, one final note before we move on. You might have noticed that China is not represented on this chart. During this time period, China is not an industrialized nation and does not collect IPCs or produce units other than infantry. 
We'll talk more about playing China a little later in the tutorial. Now, let's talk about victory points for the Japanese. One of the ways that the Japanese player can win the game is by scoring victory points. At the beginning of the game, place a Japanese control marker on space zero of this track. At the end of the Japanese player's turn, they earn a victory point for, for every 10 IPCs they collect. If the Japanese player is able to accumulate 22 victory points, then they win the game. The victory point track creates a ticking clock for the allied players. For every turn that the Japanese are not defeated, they add victory points to their total. Therefore, the allied players must work together to weaken the Japanese economy and defeat them as soon as possible. On the flip side, the allies can win the game if they can prevent Japan from collecting any victory points on the Japanese player's turn. For this to occur, Japan's IPC income would need to be reduced to 9 or less. These are the two economic ways to win the game. There are also two military ways to win as well. For a military victory, Japan must occupy one of the following allied capitals, India, New South Wales, or the USA, until the start of their next turn. Capturing Sejuan in China does not count. The Axis player must also maintain control of Japan. For an allied player to win, they must control Japan and maintain control of their own capitals. Finally, the Japanese player has another track for recording kamikaze strikes. The Japanese player is able to conduct six kamikaze strikes per game. This chart keeps track of how many have been used. On the game board, you'll notice faded Japanese emblems on sea zones around Japan. These sea zones are where Japan can conduct kamikaze strikes. During any combat phase, after all the combat moves have been completed, the Japanese player may target an allied surface ship that enters these kamikaze sea zones and conduct a strike. If the Japanese roll a two or less on their die, then the ship is destroyed. The Japanese player has six strikes they can use during the game. They can use them all at once or spread them out over the game. It's up to the Japanese player. Although kamikaze strikes can take out a surface ship, bear in mind, a battleship takes two hits to bring down. Therefore, it would take two kamikaze strikes to take out a battleship. Despite this, kamikaze strikes are very powerful. Therefore, Japanese players should be careful before charging into these waters with their expensive battleships. Next, let's look at some other interesting locales on the map. Each side has numerous air and naval bases throughout the Pacific. These bases provide a movement bonus to friendly aircraft and ships leaving from them. Many of these bases form routes that allow a nation's forces to traverse more quickly around the Pacific. For example, an aircraft usually must use one of its movement points to leave land and enter the coastline, and then a second movement point to enter the adjacent sea zone. With an air base, planes can move directly to the adjacent sea zone. Another example, a ship utilizing two naval bases can extend its range to three versus its usual range of two spaces. Therefore, keep bases and their advantages in mind when planning out your own strategies for the Pacific Theater. There are two territories on the game board that are off limits to all players. The Himalayas territory and the Soviet Union space cannot be entered or flown over by any players. The Himalayas are obvious since it's a giant mountain range. The Soviet Union is just out of bounds for this game. The Burma Road is also an important landmark that runs from India to Sichuan, China. The Allied players must work together to keep the Burma Road open at all times. As long as all territories on the Burma Road remain under Allied control, then China receives a bonus infantry unit. We'll talk more about the Burma Road a little later in the tutorial. Now let's shift back into color and discuss what needs to be done to set up the game board. When each nation places their starting units on the game board, they will reference their national setup charts. The subset grid on the left of the chart lists that nation's territories and sea zones and what starting units to place in them. The national setup chart also contains other critical references for the game. 
The right side of the inset chart contains important information about each unit, such as cost, movement, and attack and defense values. To the far right is a column of procedures for the order of play, the land and naval combat sequences. Finally, at the top of the chart, beneath the nation's name, is a reminder of the starting income in industrial production certificates. Now, I'm not going to animate units on the board because it becomes difficult to see all the various symbols and numbers necessary to teach the game. However, I will share with you that when setting up units on your own, the game provides two tools to reduce clutter. First, players can use the game's colored chips to maximize space on the board. Chips allow a player to communicate multiple units without placing all the figures on the space. Placing a unit on top of a chip stack identifies the unit type, and the colored chips beneath count as individual units. Gray chips equal one unit, and red chips equal five units. Second, for large naval groups, players can use the task force markers and cards. The task force marker is placed on the game board with a national control marker to identify the owner. On the card with the matching number, players then place their units that are assigned to that task force. Both of these components help players maximize space on the game board. Now, once all players have placed their starting units, the game is fully set up and we're ready to start learning how to play. This concludes our first episode in the tutorial series for Axis and Allies Pacific by Avalon Hill. Axis and Allies Pacific is a surprisingly complex game that experiments with many gameplay concepts for its Pacific theater setting. I hope you've enjoyed this first tutorial and look forward to your feedback in the comments section. Stay tuned for the next episode in the series where we learn about the phases of gameplay. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.